When the first B-58 Hustle bomber took the skies the 11th of November 1956, for those who had the opportunity to be present, it was incredible. Never before such a concentration of revolutionary technologies was ever included in an aircraft. Never before the crew was required to execute such complex tasks to complete the mission. In this video, the third of the series, we are going to examine some more of these technologies, but we will also be discussing the crew operations. As usual, stay till the end, because what we are going to discuss here is not easy to find in any other video. The plane featured an unusual cockpit configuration, three separated cockpits in a line. There was no physical communication between them, except for the intercom each crew member was on his own, in cramped quarters which did not permit standing for missions lasting seven to eight hours. The pilot had vision ahead and to the sides through a six-window windshield, plus two small windows in the canopy for overhead vision. The Bombardier navigator and the defense operator had a minute window the size of a notebook on each side of their cockpit. These were basically there to avoid the claustrophobia, but often they were covered by opaque cloth curtains. Each cockpit had its own individual canopy. It was hinged at the rear, moved pneumatically and it could be jettisoned if necessary. Each cockpit also had an individual escape capsule, the first enclosed escape system in an aircraft in regular service use. Flight personnel was sized for the capsule at the start of the training course and it was an essential requirement to remain in the program. The capsule could be closed and pressurized within 7 seconds in case of loss of cabin pressure at high altitude, enabling the flight personnel to avoid pressure suits. In this situation, the pilot could see part of his instrument panel through a window in the capsule door and with full control through the stick inside the capsule, he then could fly the aircraft to a lower altitude and then decapsulate. Is that a word? Buttons on the stick, a sort of early HOTAS configuration, enabled him to disconnect the autopilot, shift the center of gravity and retard the throttles while encapsulated. In an emergency, rockets ejected the capsule from the aircraft, with the enclosed personnel being protected against the harshness of the situation. After the deceleration of the capsule, the parachute deployed. Obviously, the capsule contained survival gear, including a radio, rations, water, the salting gear, clothing, and a rifle. It would stay uh, afloat if it landed in the sea. Liquid oxygen was used to feed the pressure breathing masks. The interior of the crew space was cooled by two separate air conditioning systems. In a sort of direct flow, the cabin and the crew member was cooled. Then the heat generated by the electronics was actually removed by the same air pumped through the cabin. If the electronics was in full use and it was generating too much heat, the flow was inverted and the electronics was cooled first while the crew member started sweating. To get the Hustler, the pilot had a pair of conventional rudder pedals and a massive plastic control stick, uh, with which he made the conventional control movements. Yet, he was not moving the rudder and the elevons, but he merely was activating valves which, through a power control linkage assembly, moved the control surfaces by hydraulic force. The system was efficient, but it was plagued by the stick talk back issue, a pulsating kick of the control stick when the hydraulic pressure fluctuated at the stick's extreme limits of movement. In a system like this, there is no transmission of control surface feedback through the stick and pedals, so an artificial field system provided a substitute.
other features of the flight control system were automatic responding not to the pilot input but to the commands from the autopilot computer. It derived information from the air data computer, Mach number, temperature and altitude, the gross weight computer, the tracking and flight control and crew unit, pitch and roll correction, primary navigation system, pitch, roll and heading signals, and the rate gyro and accelerometer package. These assemblies control the action of the autopilot, which could also vary the engine power, together with other automatic features of the flight control system. For instance, damper servos move the control surfaces automatically to damp the rate of pitch, roll and yo because undamped movement of the Hustler, supersonic speed in particular, could have been dangerous as the aerodynamic load might have exceeded the structural limits. Now, think how excruciatingly difficult would have been doing all of this with the computers available at the time, most of them still analog devices. An automatic elevator trim system positioned the elevons to maintain constant 1G flight with the control stick in neutral. The angle assumed by the elevator depended from the airspeed, the gross weight and the location of the center of gravity. It was indicated on the instrument panel on the elevator position indicator. Another dial indicated the amount of elevator movement possible. This depended in turn on the airspeed and it was determined by the elevator ratio changer. The latter, in response to the Mac computer signals, varied the stick to control surface mechanical ratio in order to protect the aircraft against excessive G loads. All of this may seem very complicated, but it basically means that in this way, large control movements were used at lower speeds, while at high subsonic speeds, control surfaces movement was to be limited because the high uh, air pressure involved. However, at supersonic speed, with the control surfaces blanketed by shock waves, larger surface movements were required to produce the same effect. The aileron controls likewise had an automatic trim and ratio changer. By now, it should be clear that so much could go wrong so quickly in the Huster that two separate sets of warning signals, visual and auditory, were used to draw the pilot's attention to any malfunction. On the left side of the instrument panel, there was a red master warning light and a yellow one marked master caution. When lit, this drew the pilot's attention to warning and caution panels on the right side of the cockpit, where individual lamps indicated the specific trouble. Um, things like left fuel manifold low pressure, oil low number one, reservoir tank not full, aft pump number eight, hydraulic utility pump number two, cabin pressure left, all these kind of things. But this was not everything because a voice warning system was developed for the Hustler. A pre-recorded feminine voice used to break into the masculine chatter in the pilot's earphones with one of the 20 announcements like Weapon unlocked, hydraulic system failure, check for engine fire, news too high. It was the first time that anything like that was implemented and it was the cause a lot of, lot of jokes and banter. Sperry built the AM ASQ 42 bombing and navigation system, which was a masterpiece of the analog age. When operating in the navigation mode, it was literally capable of directing the B 58 Hustler by the autopilot along a great circle track at a constant Mach number and altitude to any point on the globe. The navigator simply had to set the latitude and the longitude of his true present position on his navigational control board and the latitude and longitude of his destination position on the sighting and test panel. The computer occupying the front of his cockpit did the rest, with the help of the data coming from an array of sensors. Towards the rear of the aircraft, in the fuselage between the forward and aft fuel tanks, was located the uh, inertial navigation system, with the so-called stable table, whose attitude was gyroscopically fixed while the aircraft moved around in pitch, roll and yaw. 
It was also used to provide a secondary measure of the ground speed. The primary ground speed source was a Doppler radar transmitter and receiver in the tail measuring the true ground speed by the Doppler shift of the radar signal. Above the stabilization unit and protruding slightly above the skin of the fuselage, there was a transparent and rounded cupola for the star tracker unit. Bisecting on the astro control panel, the greenish hour angle, the sidereal hour angle, and the declination of the sand or of a star to be used for navigation purposes, the system could lock on the sun or the star. It provided continuous heading information to the computer. Should the celestial bodies be obscured, heading data could be received from the remote compass transmitter inside the leading edge of the fin. The search radar in the nose displaying a radar representation of the terrain below on the scope in the navigator's cockpit uh, provided a further check on position. Crosshairs in the scope itself indicated when certain fixed points on the ground preset into the computer were coming into view. A radio altimeter measured the height above the terrain. The air data system also fed the true airspeed, pressure and altitude and air temperature into the computer. In the bombing mode, the bombing and navigation system guided the aircraft on a loxodrome line over the target, compensating for wind drift and Coriolis effect, while offset points and fixed points set into the machine beforehand came up beneath the crosshairs in the radar scope. During the run-in, the navigator, while watching the terrain below on the radar, could make small correction in heading with the tracking and flight control stick in his right hand, which operated through the autopilot. At the time calculated to provide a burst over the target, the bomb nav system in the bombing mode automatically released the weapon, a feature that was going to appear much later on other aircraft. The defense system operator in the third cockpit assisted the pilots during flight by reading checklists, advising the pilot on fuel consumption, optimum altitude, and the extremely important location of the center of gravity. His primary duties, however, were in connection with the defense systems. The plane featured track-breaking electronic equipment designed to mislead and confuse the operator of enemy radar uh, to enable the hustler to accomplish its mission unaffected by ground-to-air defenses. And this sounds incredible for the 50s. A six-barrel Vulcan 20mm cannon located in the extreme tail was directed by remote control equipment. Enemy aircraft were presented as a blip on the defense system operator's radar scope and the fire control equipment automatically locked onto the target calculated the lead and windage, aimed the gun and notified the DSO when to fire it. Uh, this was necessary because the attacking enemy aircraft was not visible to the Hustler crew. Okay, if your head is in a spin, know that we are not over yet. We have an exciting story to tell, but this will be the subject of the next video in the series. So if you like this video, I'm sure you will love the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, please like, dislike, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss any new video. And if you could consider supporting the channel on Subscribestar or Patreon, you will have my gratitude forever. In the meanwhile, Thank you very much for watching so far. You are amazing and see you next time.